all these people are probably the weirdos in their neighborhood. Yeah. Right? We were having conversations last oh. night and we were like, we're the ones that are rucking down the road with a sandbag on our shoulder and the neighbors are like, what are you doing? Movement should be variable. If your only thing is cycling, you could be super fit, but not very versatile. Fully immersive, you just live the XBT lifestyle. You wake up in the morning, we do breath work, uh, we do pool training, we do saunas, ice baths, beach training, gym training, we have nutrition talks. So it's a, it's a holistic kind of lifestyle that we just force them into. Uh, and it's a really cool group of people. It's kind of like this. The people who come there are there to experience that, to learn and to push themselves. So that's a cool group to be around. PJ, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be welcome. here. Day three, Sandlot Jacks, 2023. We got, now, now they've moved some of the obstacle course apparatus over here behind us. So our, our view has changed. What's it been like over the last couple of days? It's been awesome. Uh, it's been a crazy experience. It's my first time at a Go Ruck event, obviously first time at Sandlot Jacks, but the community here is, is pretty kick-ass. I mean, it's inspiring, like standing at our booth, watching people that are doing their fourth workout of the day and just crushing it. And then they come back for their third ice bath of the day. It's, uh, it's been a really, really fun experience for us. Well, you guys have had a very popular booth over there because from my vantage point, as I've had everybody rotating through here and having these conversations, I've been watching it. And yesterday there was a point in time where I swear there were, it was 15 deep waiting yeah. to get in there. Yeah, I think, well, the heat yesterday plus this, it's not hard to get this community to get in an ice bath because I think a lot of them are here to do hard things. And then add the heat to that. I think every time a, a hard workout finished, we'd get about a wave of 20 people coming to get in the ice and cool off. Nice. So it's been awesome. What temperature do you keep your ice baths? Typically, we try to keep them sub 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. These ones are running between 40 and like high 40s because they get warm and we just keep dumping ice into them because we're getting a lot of bodies through them. But we, we ideally keep them about, I'd say sub 42. 38 to 42 is our range. 38 to 42, good yeah. to know. The colder the better for us because it just shortens the amount of time you have to be in there. Mm. Uh, and it helps with what we're teaching here, which is like how to overcome the shock response and use the breath as a tool. So the colder, the more shocking it is for people, and then the more we can teach them those tools. Nice. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about some of those details as we get into it. For sure. Well, you're hitting on two of the two two of the fundamentals of XPT in recover, which includes ice and heat, and I see this the sauna over there too, and breath work. But let's talk talk for a minute about XPT. You know, talk about what the focus is, what the mission is, and where it came from. For sure. Uh, XPT started as really just an exploration from Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese. They're the co-founders of the company. And it was just their way of exploring how to live a high performance lifestyle. They're obviously both very accomplished athletes and they wanted to keep pushing hard as, as they got older, but also they didn't want to just only live in that lane. So they're like, how can we be better parents? How can we be better business people? And how can we kind of uh, what they call extreme performance, which is ba create balance in all of those areas. Uh, so it was just them exploring all the different things. They obviously have a lot of friends who are experts in the space who would come through and recommend trying different stuff. And they just compiled all those things together and, and what works for them. And then started getting groups of people that would come over and train and were just like, this is so amazing. I don't get this anywhere else. And the group got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that they said, we got to start sharing this outside of our circles of friends. So they started XPT in like 2015 and they would run retreats that were three days long. People just come out and get plugged into the XPT lifestyle. And um, I joined in 2017 because they were looking to, they, it's still running those awesome retreats, but we only have 30 people at a retreat. We run, we used to run about five of them a year. So it's still a very small amount of people we can impact. And people would leave and say, this is so amazing. Like, how do I do this when I go back to New York? And they're you know? multi-day. They're like three-day retreats, yeah, right? Yeah, three days long, fully immersive. You just live the XBT lifestyle. You wake up in the morning, we do breath work. Uh, we do pool training. We do saunas, ice baths, beach training, gym training. We have nutrition talks. So it's a, it's a holistic kind of lifestyle that we just force them into. Uh, and it's a really cool group of people. It's kind of like this. The people who come there are there to experience that, to learn and to push themselves. So that's a cool group to be around. Uh, but then the about company to sign started up. transitioning into more education because we want to get it out to more people. So that's what they hired me to do. Uh, so I've been with the company for six years now. And my job was to try to turn all that stuff that they were teaching at these retreats into more of a system that could be taught to 
coaches and trainers and doctors and military so they could actually take those things and implement them into their systems. Mm. So how do you do that? So we have those five pillars, which is breathe, move, recover, fuel, and connect. And those are the major pillars that it really, when I kind of sat down with Laird and Gabby and I was a part of all these retreats, I started seeing like, what are the, what are the key things that we're always talking about? What are the, the, the pillars that we always come back to? And what are the major levers that we're pulling on to help people improve their health or improve their performance? Uh, and I come from the sports performance world. So a lot of that was synergies with what we do when it comes to high performance athletes. We look at this holistic high performance model and I was like, they're doing all the same things. They're just not talking about it in the context of sport. Uh, so we took each of those pillars and then tried to turn those into more of a framework. For me, it was more of a tools based approach. It was uh, because I'm a performance coach. It was like, well, I can't just follow everything Laird says because I don't live Laird's life, you know? So how do I take the ideas but plug them in for my MMA athlete or my mom? Mm -hmm. And what are the differences for those people? Because they obviously both shouldn't do the same things, but the principles are the same. So that's what I tried to build was like a principles-based approach, break down the physiology and the psychology of some of these different tools we're using, and then share them with people. So when I work with military, I can say, here's how this applies more to your context. And when I work with executives, I can say, you know, the principles are the same, but here's how I would apply it in your situation because your your demands are different, but you're still both dealing with stress and you're trying to increase performance. So that's that's kind of the system that we built around the, that framework of those five pillars. I want to dig into each one of those for a couple of minutes. And sure. You start with breath. You know, and you've got, you have said that breath is the foundation of life, right? We can't, we can't live if we can't breathe. Right. Breath work is something that I think has... I, I, you've heard a lot more of it, I'd say, over the last five or ten years, and there's so many people that ascribe to it. I can't tell you how many people have sat in sat in the seat across from me and talk about, you know, the morning routine with the breath work and you know visualization and all that. Why is it the foundation, and why does that pro why does a program start there? I think it's the foundation because the way that you breathe influences every system and every cell in the body, so it, it has an impact across anything you're looking to do, whether it's performance, health sleep, digestion, pain, breath is tied to all of those things. And it can be tied in two ways. I always like to say your, your breathing can either be a weakness or a weapon. Most people it's a weakness because it's unconscious and it's driving you in one of these areas. If you're doing something that's not uh, helping you, then it's driving you towards dysfunction. But it's also the most accessible tool because all you have to do is learn a little bit about it and you can start optimizing the way that you breathe and you're doing it 20,000 times a day anyway. So it's the foundation, it ties into all those other categories. Every single pillar comes back to something to do with breath. Breath can optimize our movement, it can improve our nutrition, it can improve our recovery. It's certainly a big thing we talk about on the connection pillar. Uh, so that's why it's the foundation behind everything we do. And, and the reason I'm so passionate about sharing it, because I spent my whole career training elite athletes. And it was always cool to share what they were doing, but it didn't impact most people because most people are never gonna train a, a guy for the NFL combine. So when I'm teaching you how to improve a 40 yard dash for the NFL combine, it's like, that's fun to learn, but then you go home and it's not gonna change your life. Breath work changes people's lives and it changes people's lives across that whole spectrum. So it's it's super fun for me to be able to share it because it's such an easy tool. You know, I, I say it's, it's the, one of the most powerful and accessible tools that we have for optimizing our health, our performance, our longevity. Uh, so that's why it's the foundation behind everything we do. Yeah, I had to learn a lot about breathing properly a couple years ago when I, I learned that I was breathing almost all with like my shoulders rising. And when I learned how I couldn't just relax my upper traps, I had to engage my lower traps and serratus and pull my shoulders down. And every time I took a breath without letting my shoulders lift, I would get cramps through my scalenes because they were so tight and I really? didn't realize they weren't stretching the way they normally should on every breath. And so I had to have the constant practice of every time I remember, every 30 seconds or something, remind myself, nope, pull your shoulders down, nope, pull your shoulders down. Um, and it has changed like the structure of my neck and the amount of neck pain that I used to have has gone down yeah. so much and my shoulders function better and alignment and everything. Um, what, what kind of, do you teach the mechanics of how to breathe properly and what do you think about like nose and mouth and do you, is it like an exercise of like we do breath exercises every morning or is it more like here's how to breathe properly throughout the day or both? 
great questions. Uh, I could answer all of those in about five hours, but okay. <laughs> the simple answer is we Fair. teach a full spectrum of breath work. Our goal is to understand there's really three main dimensions of breathing. There's mechanics that you mentioned, like what muscles are you using to create ventilation? What are the What's the anatomy that's doing it? To your example, when you're using the secondary muscles, then you get all kinds of issues. And if I can, there's really cool studies where all they do is teach people how to use a diaphragm and neck pain immediately goes away. Back pain immediately goes away. I need both of those. You're, you're using the wrong muscles to do the job. Yeah. Uh, so we teach mechanics and that's really the foundation for me. It's the, it's the dimension I start with because I feel like most people have issues and my, I'm a movement specialist. So my natural tendency is like, I want to help you move well first, then we can layer things on top. But then there's the chemical dimension, uh, which is balancing blood gases. So that's Ooh. where you hear a lot about nasal breathing. Nasal breathing helps balance blood gases. There's tons of benefits to nasal breathing most of the time. Uh, but we also teach the tools. I think for, for me, when I got into breath work, it was super dogmatic. Everybody you went to was like, this is the method and this is how you do it and this is why it's the best for every person. And I'm like, nothing's the best for every person, but what's it, what's it doing? When is it great? And then who is it not good for? So nasal breathing is something that's becoming really popular <clears throat> and I'm huge on spreading that because I think most people need to breathe through the nose more often. But I also spend most of my time interacting with elite athletes and they'll come to me saying they're trying to force themselves to nasal breathe all the time and I'm like, in these competitions, nasal breathing is not your most effective strategy. Oh, good. You should be, be you should be able to switch over to breathing in the nose and out the mouth, or even in and out the mouth, because it's the right tool for the job, not because it's your only strategy when you start exercising. So that's what I try to teach people is like, let's build out that foundation so you have the option to nasal breathe when you're in first gear, second gear, third gear, and then when you get to fourth and fifth gear, let's use the nose and mouth the way you're supposed to. Uh, to move a lot of air because that's what it's there for. But so that's kind of what we teach people is that there is no good and bad. There's no right and wrong way to breathe. There's just what is the most optimal for the current activity or the demand that you're creating. And what's most optimal for us sitting here is very different than what's most optimal for people right there. And very different when you have a ruck on your back or you're in a compromised position. Like we hear about belly breathing or, or mechanics or stuff, but. I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. <laughs> Belly breathing is not the most effective way to breathe when you're hunched over in a ball and someone has their knee on your stomach. Yeah. So you if belly breathing plan. was my only strategy, I'm going to be screwed. I got to breathe into my chest and my back. And so for us, it's all about creating variability so that we can have people be able to access the right uh, tools, the right systems for whatever the job is they're trying to do. Nice. Let's talk about this. The second aspect, movement. We live in a society, and you guys are talking about this, where you know, we, we sit in a desk, we sit behind a computer, we're hunched over. Jesse's always making fun of me for sitting like this. <laughs> but that's a, that's she, she, she works out all day, and I have to sit at my, my desk and my computer. Okay, that's my new weapon. That's what I say. Yep. But how's that affecting you know, people's ability to move, and what's your focus when it comes to the movement piece? So we have two focuses. I think one is what you're saying, which is when you talk to most people, it's they need to move more often and they need to move more variably. For us, because we work with a lot of people, but we don't have to convince people to exercise who come to XPT because they come, that's like trying to convince this community to exercise, right? These people are working out four times a day. So most people here don't need to be convinced that movement's important, but what we try to do is help them understand that movement should be variable. If your only thing is cycling, you could be super fit, but not very versatile. And a lot of people come to XPT and we plug them into a lot of different stuff. So one of our big missions is to help people be as versatile and resilient as possible. Laird always says, don't be a liability. And that's really how he lives his life. He wants to be able to go surf an 80 foot wave and then like go on a 50 mile bike ride and then go balance on a thing. Like he wants to have all of this capability so that he's never a liability and he can do whatever he wants to do, whatever his body wants him to do and his mind wants him to do. So that's a lot of what we teach because people come to us and they're a CrossFitter or they're a cyclist or they're a yogi. All of those things are great, but when you only do one, you only develop down that path and you start to neglect other really important qualities. Yogis are crazy flexible usually not very strong, usually not very powerful, usually not very agile. Crossfitters, super powerful, super strong, not very agile, not very resilient because they only train in one dimension. So a lot of what we do is 
help you to see what are the other buckets that you're not tapping on. And if you're trying to be an elite CrossFitter, well, you shouldn't spend all your time in these other buckets because you need to specialize. But if the longer you specialize and neglect the other things, the more it's going to start to be a performance anchor for you or cause injuries or limitations down the road. So that's a lot of what we work on is just, let's look at the things you're not developing and let's help you be a holistic human. But for us, it's a lot of people are like, they're hard chargers. So we, we talk about them like an athlete. And when an athlete comes to me, that's what I do. I assess them in all of those qualities and then see what are your limitations, what are your weaknesses, and how can we sprinkle in just enough of that to make sure that that doesn't hinder your performance down the road. How do you customize your program? And, or how does, how does one access your program? Currently, we have an app that people can go on. Uh, a lot of, we've got a lot of training programs in there. We have tons of breath work. I mentioned a tools-based approach. So our breath work in the program, in the app is literally like five minute post-work down regulation. So if I know I just finished work, I only have five minutes and I need to come down because I'm stressed out, I can click that protocol and then me or Laird or Gabby or one of our coaches will literally just guide you through this protocol. And we have them for like getting energized before a workout, midday, feeling tired. We have them for all different uh, situations. And then training, we've got a bunch of workouts in there. We have training programs because we, the fitness space is big on people who like to do fitness, but I'm a performance coach. So I know that like just doing a bunch of fitness is like just driving randomly and hoping you're going to get to a destination. You, know, you, you start in LA and you just start driving. You might end up in New York, but it might take you four years to get there or you might have end up in Alaska. So for us, it's more about putting people on a program where it's say like, what are you trying to do? Is your goal to build strength? Is your goal to do this? And if you do, then here's a program that'll help get you there. But in that program, we're gonna make sure we sprinkle in just enough of those other things. So you're not gonna get to the point two years from now where you got really, really strong. And now you're like, oh, I'm super strong. I wanna start playing basketball again. And we're like, well, no, 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 you're not ready for that. You haven't been prepared for that with your training. Mm -hmm. You're just really strong and fit. So we want to make sure that we, we develop people holistically through that. But we're uh, later on this year, we're going to be launching gym, performance gyms uh, and recovery centers where we uh, our big thing is we have to teach coaches how to use this full system, how to pull the right levers at the right time for people. Uh, so we're launching gyms so that we can really do that. And people can come in and get personalized programming. And then we'll have in our app as well for people who can't do the gym, they'll have a digital coach, but it'll be a more one on one experience where you could come in just for breath work, but what I find a lot of times, whatever the entry point is, one of those other pillars is typically a limitation that you maybe are unaware of. Yeah. So if your entry point was, was movement training, we'll start with that. But I'm going to find out really quickly that stress management is a reason that you're not getting to your performance goals and breath work is a tool that we could use to manage your stress and there, therefore I can still get you to your performance goals but it wasn't really about the training it was the other pillar that you weren't focused on or recovery or nutrition uh, so those are kind of the access points we have for the brand later this year so that we can impact more people yeah I always find that's really helpful if like if I've been neglecting breath work because it sounds boring and and like kind of low level and lame and then someone explains to me how it's going to affect my performance and then puts it into an exercise format then I'm like oh now I get how it's going to make me better and I have a exercise and workout plan for my breathing right and then it sounds cool so it sounds like you're you are accessing here's your interest first now here's how this tool yeah. is going to add to it and it's training I mean, that, that's the, one of the points that's another reason i love breath work is when i was training mma athletes they're already training four to six hours a day every day they're all over training you just can't stack in more hours of training but they're looking for how can i get better in the time that i'm not in the gym and i'm like well breath work mindset techniques there's a bunch of stuff there's a there's work we can do just because it's not high intensity doesn't mean it's not work so, and a lot of times it's it's the hard thing. I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Carrie Walsh a while ago. She's a friend of the company. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, Olympic volleyball. Yeah, did player. they play together? Uh, I don't know if they played together, but they knew each other from yeah. that from that world. And one of the things she said was, as a professional athlete, we 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 uh, pride ourselves on doing what's hard, but working out hard is not hard for us. Right? We love it. Yeah. Like yeah. We show up and train hard and we wear that as a badge of pride, but that's not hard. We, we enjoy that. Recovering is hard. Mobility work is hard. 
breath work, that's the stuff that we're like, oh, I don't want to do this. And that's how normal people feel when it comes to exercise. And we're like, what do you mean? Just do it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> and, you know? But for us, yeah. it's like, it's our comfort zone. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because she was saying to be an elite professional athlete, you have to do what's hard. And that doesn't mean train harder. Mm. A lot of times it means recover more, do the stuff that you don't enjoy doing that's going to make you better. Yeah, that was a game changer for me. I had to redefine like rest days and self-care as intense discipline and active recovery. Yeah. Because just like just shifting the way I phrase it in my head made it sound hard and inspiring, which is what I'm drawn to. Right. Terminology is critical. I mean, you mentioned yoga earlier uh, or breath work and how it's becoming more popular. This stuff, we're not re reinventing this. Yogi's yeah. been doing a lot of this for a long time. The problem was hard charging type A performance people were like, eh, that's like weird. <laughs> stuff. I was the same way. Put more weight on the bar. Yeah, Quiet. I first got into breath work and like yoga. I would try to push my athletes to go do yoga on recovery days and like, nah. Ours is called performance breathing. And Good it call. connects with people. We put people <laughs> in the ice bath and we teach them the same calming mindfulness techniques that you would learn if you like worked with a sports psychologist. Mm -hmm. But we put you in an ice bath and it feels extreme and it like it's a training thing for you, but we're still training your mind in the same way. We're just not doing it through talk therapy. Mm -hmm. We're doing it through intense pool training or ice baths or these other situations. Yeah. So that's what we always say, like XPT is is meditation and mindfulness training for non meditators. Because yeah. we're people like you who want to train <laughs> and uh, and we're all the same way so mm -hmm. that's that's why I think there's such a big connection for me personally and for the people that we work with because it's like the thing they know they should be doing but they never had an entry point that made sense to them and now mm -hmm. we're speaking their language so it's really helpful for them to get the, the work that they need yeah and with the ice bath it's not just that hey this is a hard thing that's gonna make it seem intense and mental discipline what are some of the amazing physical benefits of using an ice bath regularly. There's tons of physical benefits from like recovery, reducing inflammation, the stuff that athletes been doing it for a long time. But I think that that's barely scratching the surface. Most athletes who come to ice baths with us are like, I've never done something like that before. Because really? if you're an athlete, you grow up and you do, you dump some ice in the thing and you sit in there at your waist and you sit on your phone and you oh, just dip yeah. around. <laughs> what we do right. is we teach people one. Yeah, that, that's present. not what I do in the ice bath. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we make them way colder. We force you to get all the way into your neck. That changes things. And then we force you to be present. You know, people get in and they're asking me yesterday, um, if we like to do like intense breathing to get amped up before you go in. And I'm like, we do the complete opposite. We're putting you in there and it's gonna get intense. What I want you to do is relax through it. I'm confident everybody here could fight through a 10 minute ice bath over there, right? They're all proving that they could suffer for a long period of time. That doesn't impress me. I could suffer through that too. What I wanna see is, can you relax into that very uncomfortable thing? Because fighting, it's not gonna help and it's not gonna give you the recovery benefit. So for us, it's, can you let go? Can you relax in this really uncomfortable opportunity where you're, emotionally stressed and physically stressed can you just surrender into that and let go into that and that's where you get a lot of the psychological benefits we teach them breathing techniques so that'll help them to relax there laird puts you at the bottom of the pool with dumbbells in your hand under 12 feet of water and then we put you in the ice bath and the sauna you may never do any of those things again but hopefully you leave with tools that are going to help you when you're in traffic when you're fighting with your spouse, when you're dealing with stress at work. Like those are all the tools we're teaching you in the ice bath or the pool are the exact same tools that you're gonna use in those other situations. Or for my athletes, when they're walking out to the cage in a UFC fight or you know, preparing for a, for a big game. Um, so that's a lot of the benefits that we teach. So we have, we have different protocols. If you're looking for physical recovery, we have a protocol. If you're looking for mental, emotional recovery, like you're just stressed, but you're not physically stress it's a slightly different protocol uh, if you're looking to build mental resilience because some people do you see it now on Instagram everyone's like I do ice baths every day every morning 100 days straight for those people it's about building a habit and doing something challenging and that's a very different application it's great but there's a different thing if people look at ice baths and they're like oh it's either good or bad and how cold should it be and at what time and I'm like how much should you squat <laughs> And be like, oh, well, that depends on, you know, the context. And I'm like, exactly. 
how much you should squat based on you, who you are as an individual, what's your training goal, what's your background, and even the type of squat you should do is gonna be different. And that's how we talk about these tools, it's the same. The body's not a textbook, so we have different applications for different adaptations uh, that people are looking for. Did I answer your question or did I take it on my own tangent? I don't know what my question was, <laughs> but I, I liked a lot of things and it sparked like 20 new questions and okay. now I forgot all of them. Um, but we'll come back to that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, well we, hit, we hit a lot of the recovery piece. I want to ask you about that, that, fifth, that fifth pillar, the connect. Why is that? So maybe we're here, we're, we're at Sandlot Jacks. It's all about building the community. It's all about being together. We, A lot of the times when we see forward progress in, in companies and in organizations in society, it's because we're present with each other, because we're forming a bond. We've reached a point where we think it's normal now that the majority of our interaction is done on text message. Yeah. Okay? And if we're lucky, we'll get on a video call, right? Which is still one, it's still transactional. Why is connect so important? It's funny because when I joined XPT, the pillars were breathe, move, recover. That was the tagline. And I started going to these experiences and seeing one, nutrition was a big part of it. But I was like, there's something that we talk about. There's something that everybody talks about when they're here. There's something else to what we're doing that's really bringing it all together. And it should be one of the pillars. And we looked at it and I was like, it's the connection piece. And we break down connection to three elements. And also looking at a lot of research on like, people who live the longest, people who are the happiest. So there's a lot of similarities as you start drawing those paths. Athletes who perform the best. Uh, elite military. I'm fortunate to work with a lot of special forces communities. I keep looking at the pillars that they're talking about and there's the family and there's the relationships. So uh, we look at connection as one connection to yourself, which is developing self-awareness. And we do that through a lot of the different tools. What's the self-talk that you're doing when we put you in that ice bath? And can we rewrite that narrative to help you be more successful in other areas of your life? Um, What's the awareness of your body? Like, do you need to wear 18 different trackers to tell you what you should be doing and when you should be drinking and all that? Or can we use those trackers as a tool to develop more awareness of our body so that we can start to auto-regulate the way we're supposed to? Because you shouldn't need all that stuff to tell you when you slept shitty or when you trained too hard. Uh, but we just, we dysregulated it and we, we passed all that off. So connection to yourself is a huge thing that we teach and we do it through every other pillar. The one that you mentioned is connection to others community is how we thrive and uh, a lot of times I think that's this is what what's awesome about the XBT community but also the go Ruck community all these people are probably the weirdos in their neighborhood yeah right we were having conversations last Aww. night and we were like we're the ones that are rucking down the road with a sandbag on our shoulder and the neighbors are like what are you doing we're the ones pushing the truck down the road and and be you know doing a sauna and ice bath on Friday night instead of going to the bar, we're the weirdos in our neighborhoods and in our friends and we all feel kind of abnormal until you start to rebuild your community and that's what XPT brings to a lot of people. People show up and they're like, oh, there's actually other people that would much rather listen to a lecture on nutrition than like watch the Kardashians. Uh, this is cool to be around because I feel like in my family, I feel like a weirdo who wants to eat healthy instead of going to this thing, you know? And so that's the community aspect. Obviously, people push themselves further when they do stuff together. So that's a big part of what we try to do is, is build that uh, connection in person and then build that community of others around you. Uh, and then the last piece of, of the connect pillar is connecting to something outside yourself. And that's a huge thing for people that are the most successful in, in almost every area, as you'll find they have a deep connection to spirituality in whatever that means to them. Uh, at XPT, a lot of it for us is a connection to nature. That's a big thing that's a part of Laird and Gabby's life every day. It's like developing a deep connection to nature and a, and a respect for it. And, a, you know, obviously Laird surfing these giant waves, like you have to have this connection to this thing that is so much more powerful than you. Um, a lot of people, that's religion. Uh, we're not specific on what that is. We just say that if that's an area that's missing in your life, it's a performance anchor. And at some point, subconsciously, that will be limiting you. Uh, and we, you know, that's another big thing for us when I'm working with athletes. A lot of times it's like, I find out that the reason they're not performing well is because their relationships are shit. So I can't, as a performance coach, I can't just keep jamming into the movement thing and going, oh, we just need to move more and recover more and move more and recover more. And it's like, no, we're, you know, we filled that cup. Let's talk about these other things that are, that are really 
hindering your performance and driving you down and how can we optimize those things to, to all be successful. So um, that was a pillar that we added as one of the main things and it was always a part of the company. It was just like the thing that tied all the other stuff together and I was like, we need to talk about this as important as this, even though it's hard to measure and that's why people don't talk about it. It's, it's hard to create a metric or a, you know, I love um, Michael Easter's kind of metrics on like how often you should get out in nature because it's like a lot of people come to XPT and they're like, oh, there's a number now. You know, I don't know if you are familiar, if you've read The Comfort Crisis. So he, he, he was there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he talks about the, uh, I think it's 23-5 rule. And it's like 20 minutes, three times a week, just in nature somewhere, like in your backyard, walking down the street, whatever, just outside. Climate tree. Yep. And then it's uh, three hours, or no, it's five hours once a month in like broader nature, like go to the park and be out there, or go to the beach and like be really immersed in nature. And then like three days a year, fully off the grid and like disconnected from technology and out in the woods or something like that. And that's what he recommends in his book. But anyway, I don't wanna to go too far down that tangent because he's the expert on that, but it's cool because it's a quantifiable thing of like, oh, this is this other really important thing that can actually drive my health and drive my performance. Mm -hmm. And now I have some sort of metric of like, am I doing it well or not? Yeah, hold on, what was the name of that again? Can we? Uh, Comfort Crisis? Comfort, Comfort Crisis. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Give it to you. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, he's, he's the the, he's um, great. the MC for all the speaking and stuff here. So his book is a, is a his book is basically a Bible of all things XPT. It's, it's about getting uncomfortable and using that as a way to improve the way we are as humans mm -hmm. in every area, and that's really what we do at XPT. Okay. I love it. Yeah, I wanna go, I wanna go to one of these seminars. So <laughs> call you after this, figure that yeah, out. Yeah, come to some of our yeah, retreats. So they're they're also awesome. super fun. We do them in Malibu or Kauai or Costa Rica, so it's, oh, it's, wow. a, it's a really, really cool community and a, a cool experience. It's well, the best part of my job. I wanted to ask you, how do you teach <laughs> Like I love the carrying the weight at the bottom of the pool and, and how you were saying we develop those skills that then apply to life in traffic or arguments or whatever. How do you teach people to translate that? Because I know I'm much better at overcoming discomfort and staying calm in crazy intense situations, but if I lose my keys and I'm running late, I might have a meltdown. Yep. So how do you, how do you transfer that skill? So we teach terminology that transfers. So Ooh. a lot of it is, the cool part about the pool training is it's failure and it's fear. And those are things that people don't face as often. And when they do, they're in such a, it's such a big deal that they don't look at it as an opportunity until it's later on. Maybe we look back and go, man, my business failed or my relationship failed. How can I learn from that? But you're way outside of that, the space of that failure or that fear or whatever it was. So for us, it's like, we're gonna put you in the pool. doesn't matter who you are, elite Navy SEALs, free divers, surfers, or like people who don't swim ever, we will find your failure limit very quickly. Because we're gonna put you at the bottom of the pool, we're gonna force you to hold your breath, and we're gonna make you do complex tasks that are gonna challenge you cognitively. So we'll, we'll figure out what that wall is for you really fast, and you'll fail. Guaranteed, 100%, everybody will fail at an XBT experience. That's the point. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, we're gonna just make it harder. But when you find that failure, then quickly we can be we can pull people out and go, how are you talking to yourself before that? One of the most common things I see is people come in, they push themselves hard, they, they screw the thing up, they come up and they're like, damn it, and they get all pissed off. And I was like. Do they know they're supposed to fail in that exercise? We start the day, I my first talk is telling them that. I'm like, let go of your performance expectations mm -hmm. at this experience because we will make you fail. Uh -huh. It might be in the ice bath, It might. it's probably gonna be in the pool, it might be in a, the beach workout, but we will find your limitation. It's That's what we're designed to do, our coaches are great at doing it. When we find it, we're gonna help you through it and understand that that's the point. So we're gonna figure out what you're doing at that failure immediately before, during, and after that failure point. And then we're gonna help you with some tools of like, what were you thinking about? Let's use a simple example. If I told you to take these weights and walk to that side of the pool and back, half the people will stop at that side of the pool. And I'm like, well, was that your end point? Or was that just the middle ground where you stopped, turned around and went, I can't get all the way back, so I'm gonna stop here. So one of the, t the tools we teach is a psychological chunking, which is a, a simple way of saying, like the fastest, the best way to climb a mountain is one step at a time. So instead of looking at the other end of the pool and going, I can't make it there, go, I'm gonna get to the wall and just push off. And once you push off, take two more steps. And then two more steps and two more steps. Or in the ice bath, 
give me, I did this yesterday with a, a woman who was freaking out completely. She tried it three times, got out immediately. And I was like, don't worry about it. I'm going to be here with you. Give me one more breath. Okay, great, great. Give me one more and then you're done. One more breath. And she did that for like three minutes of one nice. more breath, one more breath, one more breath. If I said, you're good, you know, it's been 10 seconds. You got two, two minutes, 50 left. She would have been out. Right. So that's one of the tools we teach them. And then we teach applications. So a lot of what we do is put you in the intense situation, force you to fail, force you to struggle, force you to do this, and then sit down after and, and do a after action review. What were you saying to yourself when you did that? Okay, can we rewire that? Let's pick one thing and let's change it. Maybe it was the way you approached the thing. Maybe it was the thing you said after it and the way you beat yourself up after the failure. Whatever it was, we'll pull a thing out, we'll give a, a language to it, and then we'll, I'll like rewrite it. So rewrite that for yourself. And then tomorrow, we're gonna do it again. Yeah. So you're gonna get to practice it again. And that's what one of the coolest things about ice baths for sure, but pool training especially, is because everybody fails and because you can fail over and over and over and you're safe, it's a really, really cool opportunity for, you know, when I was training my MMA fighters, it was really hard to find a point where they got to the, the point where they were like, I can't do this. Like to get them there physically, people who fight against the best fighters in the world for four hours a day, to get them to that point physically, I'd have to take them through some crazy, like, you know, buds training, hell week. And the cost of that would be like three weeks of recovery. I don't, we don't have the luxury of doing that with these athletes, but I could get them to failure in the pool really quickly and help them to feel the same emotions that they feel when they're walking out to the cage on the biggest fight of their lives. Mm -hmm. The same stress, the same anxiety, the same fear. And then we can practice overcoming that in a really controlled environment. And that's something that's really, really hard to replicate in other areas of your life. Uh, but a lot of times you might do it, like we do hard work and hope that that'll carry over we have language and tools around that hard work so that we can help frame it into something that's like, here's the thing that you did. Yeah. Here's what didn't work for you. Here's the word we use for that. And then here's a tool to try and then try it. And then that. you'll come back and be like, I still failed. That didn't work. Okay, great. We got plenty of tools. Yeah. That wasn't the right one for you. Let's try this one or let's apply it in a different way. So that's how we teach people to translate that stuff. And it's a big premise of like, you know, if, he, if people come to the XPT experience just to learn some cool pool exercises, that's awesome for you, <laughs> but you have missed the opportunity there um, of really what you can take out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why the, the military uses water a lot because it's we call it the great equalizer. Right. Absolutely. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how fit you are. It changes the game for everything. Yeah. So I think we gotta. I think we gotta hit that ice bath. Oh yeah. With, with, yeah, with, I want to learn the PJ. breathing. For sure. So yeah, we'll come, come, we'll come today, find we'll you in a bit. We'll Absolutely, come find you in a bit and do that. So, well, PJ, this this is great. I mean, awesome program. Love covering all this stuff. We got to we got to get out to one of these seminars, learn more about it. Absolutely, love what's going on in terms of how efficiently and how clearly you're breaking this stuff down. So this isn't as you said, this isn't complex, you know, rocket science here. Right. You know, we're talking about fundamental things that will increase our performance that a normal person can incorporate into their life absolutely every day. Yeah. So, appreciate you taking the time. We got a long day ahead of us. The finals are coming up this afternoon. We got the we got front row seats. Yeah, it's right here. Be awesome. So and we're gonna spend some time with you in uh, some 40 degree water yeah come get some ice baths today for sure <laughs> we will i'm excited about it thank you so much for coming thank you for having me awesome American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow. <laughs>